Hi, this lecture is about growth and development. This is an, a very important topic in pediatric orthopedic. A good source that you can use is this book, The Guide to Pass the Final Orthopedic Exam, written by myself. First, let's differentiate between growth and development. Growth is basically increasing the size, whether increasing the size of the body, organ, uh, organ system, or extremity. Development is the physiological change in maturation. So when the child starts like sitting or walking, that's called development. So this is the difference between growth and development. It is important when we study the growth is to study the growth plate. This is very important part of the, um, the skeleton in uh, pediatric patients. So basically the difference between pediatric uh, skeleton and adult skeleton is they have a growth plate. Um, and the growth plate um, is formed of layers. There is the reserve layer in which the cells, the growing cells are uh, there. Uh, they are uh, in, in the quiet stage. And then after that, there is the proliferative zone. In this zone, the cells are proliferating. And then after that, there is the zone of hypertrophy. Zone of hypertrophy differs between different uh, uh, references. So you will find that sometimes some of the books tells you that the zone of hypertrophy is maturation and degeneration. Like here, the maturation and degeneration are the zone of hypertrophy. And there is a separate zone of zone of calcification. Other books will consider provisional calcification as part of the hypertrophic zone. So the reserve zone, these are uh, zones that are uh, quiet. Uh, they are resting zones. Sometimes they call it the resting zone. Then the cells start to proliferate. They are called proliferative zone. And then the hypertrophic zone. The hypertrophic zone, as we said, um, in some books it is maturation and degeneration. And in others it's maturation, degeneration, and provisional calcification. Uh, so you have after that the zone of provisional calcification. We discussed that in certain uh, references, it's a zone by itself, and in certain reference, it's part of the hypertrophy zone. And then after that, you will have the metaphysis, uh, which is the primary spongiosa and the secondary spongiosa. So growth plate histology, very important. It comes frequently in the exam, as we're going to see. Uh, reserve zone or resting zone, proliferative zone, and then hypertrophy zone, uh, which is zone of maturation and degeneration and provisional calcification. Certain book will consider provisional calcification as a separate zone different the, than the hypertrophy zone. Then comes the metaphysis. So let's speak about the growth uh, plate histology in more details and about the characteristics of each layer. So we started first with the reserve zone. As we said, the reserve zone, other names of it is resting zone, or sometimes they call it germinal uh, zone. It has uh, the cells that are quiescent. Um, the, it is, uh, has lots of extracellular matrix, and it has the lowest oxygen concentration consistent with low cellular activity. So these are resting zones, and they are not proliferating so they have very low oxygen concentration and they have the lowest oxygen concentration of the um, uh, growth plate and this is consistent with their low cellular activity remember there is uh, the reserve zone or the resting zone is closest to the epiphysis so the epiphysis is basically here and the metaphysis is here so the reserve zone it's um, uh, consists of a small round cell lots of extracellular matrix low oxygen concentration consistent with its low cellular activity now we go to the second zone which is the proliferative zone so the epiphysis is here first zone is the reserve resting or germinal zone the second zone is the proliferative zone as the name tells you the cells start to proliferate they so from round they will start to flatten and form columns of cells um, and this will be the proliferative zone these cells will start synthesize extracellular matrix like proteogranulacans and collagen uh, so this zone here the proliferative zone has the highest rate of extracellular matrix synthesis the, so the cells will change from round to flattened form columns of cell and start synthesizing extracellular matrix like collagen and proteoglycans and this zone here the proliferative zone will have the highest rate of extra cellular matrix synthesis. Now, after we finish the reserve and proliferative, let's go to the hypertrophy, consistence of maturation, degeneration, and provisional calcification. As I said, some textbook will consider provisional calcification as a separate layer. So in the zone of the hypertrophy, now the, the cells which were uh, uh, flattened in the proliferative zone start to increase in size. 
um, uh, in the zone of maturation and after that starts the degeneration process in the zone of degeneration and once they uh, reach the final uh, degeneration and death uh, the uh, calcium will be deposited in the zone of provisional calcification so hypertrophy zone is maturation and then degeneration and then calcification so these are the layers of hypertrophic zone as, as we and we said uh, some of the textbook will consider provisional calcification as a separate zone um, uh, we said that the proliferative zone has the highest uh, uh, um, rate of extracellular matrix. This extracellular matrix in the hypertrophy zone actually started to decrease, so the uh, collagen and proteoglycans um, started to decrease in the zone of the hypertrophy, and this uh, zone is uh, subjected, um, is least resistant to the stress, so fractures will occur through the hypertrophy zone. So the hypertrophic zone, which is maturation, degeneration, and provisional classification, will have decreased uh, uh, extracellular matrix and it's uh, uh, least resistant uh, to the uh, stress uh, so um, um, fractures that happen in the growth plate happen through the hypertrophy zone so the blood supply for the growth plate comes mainly from the perichondrial artery so the main blood supply of the growth plate comes from the uh, perichondrial artery Mechanical support of the growth plate comes from the perichondrial ring of Lacroix. So the mechanical support of the growth plate comes from the perichondrial ring of Lacroix and something called a positional growth. The positional growth is the, um, uh, the uh, growth at the periphery is performed by the groove of Ranvier. So the blood supply, main blood supply for the uh, growth plate comes from the perichondrial artery. The mechanical support is from the perichondrial ring of Lacroix and a positional growth, which is gross at the addition of the periphery, is by the groove of V. So now we're going to discuss pathologies that affect certain part of the growth plate, the reserve zone or the resting zone. Uh, Gaucher disease and diastrophic dysplasia. So the Gaucher disease and diastrophic dysplasia affecting the reserve zone. The proliferative zone is affected in both gigantism and achondroplasia. So um, uh, reserve zone, remember Gaucher disease and diastrophic dysplasia. Proliferative zone, uh, gigantism and achondroplasia. Gigantism will have overgrowth, achondroplasia will have undergrowth. Now let's talk about zone of provisional calcification. The zone of provisional calcification has many pathologies that happen through them. Uh, first one is the injury, so slipped epiphysis and a fracture that go through the growth plate, a physial injury like Sulter Harris 1 uh, and 2. These occur actually through the zone of provisional calcification. What is the importance of that? It, uh, that means that the reserve and the proliferative zones are actually still intact. Uh, so these um, uh, fractures um, uh, uh, even uh, they happen through the growth plate the reserve and the proliferative zone are intact so uh, there is um, the, the fractures the, the growth plate can grow normally after healing of the fracture because there is as we said the reserve and the proliferative zone remain intact so the uh, physial injury and slipped epiphysis occur through the zone of provisional calcification and that's uh, uh, important because the reserve and the proliferative zone are intact, which allows uh, the uh, children to continue to grow after healing of the fracture. A few points I'd like to mention them here uh, that, uh, as we said, a provisional zone of provisional calcification in some textbook, it's part of the hypertrophic zone. So if you get a question about physial fractures, and they ask you uh, which zone happened, and they give you both um, options, zone of hyper, uh, uh, hypertrophy zone and provisional calcification, pick the zone of provisional calcification. If you only uh, see in the answer zone of hypertrophy, pick the zone of hypertrophy, because as we said, provisional calcification in some textbook are part of the hypertrophic zone. So if you get both options, of course, pick the zone of hypertrophic uh, zone of uh, provisional calcification because this is more specific. So injuries and Sulter Harris uh, injuries uh, like Sulter Harris one and two and slip epiphysis will happen through the zone of uh, provisional calcification, which, as we said, some uh, will consider as part of the hypertrophic zone. Um, uh, this leaves the reserve and the proliferative zone. Um, intact so the uh, child can continue to grow after healing of the fracture. Uh, 
distal femur physis distal femur physis is uh, slightly different than other physis because it has many ups and downs uh, so that's why the fracture usually go through multiple layers so it's not only the provisional calcification it affects frequently the proliferative and the reserve zone that's why the distal uh, femur physial fracture the sultar harris one and two of the distal femur um, can uh, uh, or in most cases will lead to growth disturbance so um, a fracture um, through the growth plate will happen through the provisional um, uh, provisional calcification leaving the reserve and the proliferative zone intact uh, which um, uh, will allow the child to grow normally however the fracture that grew, uh, happened through the distal femur um, physis because the distal femur physis as, as you said has ups and downs so the fracture that will happen will, will, will go through uh, multiple layers not only the hypertrophic um, uh, not only the provisional calcification which is uh, part of the hypertrophic zone um, it will um, uh, affect uh, the reserve uh, zone and the um, uh, proliferative uh, uh, zone uh, leading to a higher chance of growth disturbance. We will continue with other pathologies affected provisional calcification. So in the previous slide, we talked about injuries, Sulter Harris uh, 1 and 2, and slip epiphysis. Um, two other diseases that also affect the zone of provisional calcification um, uh, is the repetitive stress uh, trauma, like uh, a little league elbow, little league shoulder, uh, gymnast stress. All this happens through, through in the zone of provisional calcification. It actually causes inhibition of ossification, and that will result in widening of the zone of hypertrophy because there is as we said failure of ossification in the zone of provisional calcification scurvy also uh, happens in the zone of provisional calcification we know that scurvy is uh, due to um, efficiency of vitamin c and uh, this will result in decrease in chondroitin sulfate and collagen synthesis um, so if you get an x-ray here uh, there will be like dense zone here at the provisional calcification uh, so scurvy uh, low vitamin c also affect provisional calcification um, uh, it will there will be resultant deficiency in chondroitin sulfate and collagen synthesis and when you get an x-ray there will be like a sclerosis area uh, dense sclerosis at the zone of provisional calcification so in the prov zone of provisional calcification we talked about uh, trauma we talked about repetitive stress and scurvy um, and as you remember um, we said provisional calcification in some books is considered part of the zone of hypertrophy we're continuing to talk about the growth plate so what is the mechanism of premature closure of the physis that ha that occurs after injury it is invasion of the physis by blood vessels so the blood vessel will invade the physis and will connect between the metaphysis and the epiphysis when the blood vessel invade that physis they will bring osteoplast that will form bony part so um, uh, as we said previously that the growth plate of the distal femur is up and down up and down so when the fracture happens it does not go only through the provisional calcification it goes through the resting and the proliferative zone that um, result in more than likely to have a growth disturbance and this will happen by a bony bar here or uh, a bony connection between the two sides so the blood vessel will invade here and will connect the metaphysis to the epiphysis forming bony bar and it's more common as we said in the distal femur physis because of its shape so the mechanism of premature closure of the physis is invading are by the blood vessel connecting the metaphysis to the epiphysis now we'd like to discuss uh, two principles that affect the uh, uh, physis or the growth plate first one is the hutter volkman principle and it um, it says that the rate of the growth um, of the physis is affected by the pressure applied to its axis what does it mean means if you pull if you do a longitudinal tension that will stimulate the growth and if you compress that it will inhibit the growth and this we use this um, principle all the time when we put a growth modulation uh, the stables or the uh, plates the growth modulation plate uh, um, uh, all companies have growth modulation plate we use them if, uh, if there is um, uh, coronal uh, or even sometimes in the sagittal uh, uh, deformity so in this uh, case of uh, adolescent blonde so we put a growth modulation plate here to inhibit the growth here and allow the growth from one side correcting the deformity so this depend on hutter volkman principle so if you do if you apply longitudinal tension you will stimulate the growth if you apply compression 
information, you will inhibit the growth. And we use this principle all the time in the cases of correction of the deformity in a skeletally immature patient. We apply the, uh, the um, plate uh, or the stables at the apex of the deformity so that the other side can grow and can correct that deformity. So they may bring you a picture like this in a, ca a case of patient Blount applying the growth modulation plate and asking you what principle do they use? They use the uh, Houter Volkmann principle. Another law similar to Holtman, uh, Holter Volkmann law is the Wolf's law. Wolf's law discussed that the bone will adapt to the applied stress, meaning that the areas that see um, uh, increase the stress will see uh, more dense bone and the area that see less stress will see less dense bone uh, so the areas that has increased the stress will become stronger and the areas that gets less stress will become weaker so if you see this picture here there is compression stresses on this area and there is tension stresses on this area however the area in the middle has very minimal stress so this area will become weaker and less dense bone and you will have more um, denser bone here and here than in the middle because th these two areas see more stress than in the middle. Uh, the fact that uh, with absolute stability you get primary bone healing and with secondary stability you get a secondary bone healing with more bone, this is an example of the wool flow. So because there is um, less stability, the bone see more stress and you get more um, colors, this is an example of the wool flow. We'll go back to the growth of the extremity. It's very important to understand the growth in pediatric orthopedic it helps us take decision about remodeling and about the expected growth is as we're going to see later so for the upper extremity most of the growth um, uh, of the humerus will happen from the upper humerus so 80% of the humerus growth will happen from the upper humerus and 80% of the forearm will happen from the uh, uh, distal radius and distal ulna uh, distal humerus and proximal humerus and ulna only give 20% of the arm and 20% of the forearm. So for the whole extremity, 40% will become from the uh, proximal humerus, 40% from distal radius and ulna, and about 20% uh, from uh, the distal uh, uh, humerus and proximal ulna radius, which is around the elbow. So upper extremity, mainly from upper humerus, 80% of the humerus comes from the humeral, uh, proximal humerus, 80% of the forearm comes from the distal radius and distal ulna, only 20% of the humerus comes from the distal humerus, 20% of the uh, uh, forearm comes from the proximal radius and ulna, the whole extremity, 40% here, 40% here, and 20% around the elbow. Uh, and now the lower limb has slightly different so the lower limb actually grows more from around the knee so um, for the femur about 70 percent of the femur growth comes from the distal femur uh, and 30 percent will come from uh, proximal femur so uh, in the humerus it's 80 20 in the femur it's about 70 uh, 30. Uh, tibia uh, is a slightly different uh, the uh, tibia uh, is uh, about 75% of the 75% uh, of the lower leg um, comes from the proximal uh, tibia and about 43% uh, from the distal tibia. If you want to make it easier, you can say 55 and 45. So um, uh, femur. Uh, here will grow 70% uh, 70 per 70 from the distal femur, 30% from the proximal femur. Uh, and the tibia, uh, it is 55% from the proximal tibia and 45% from the distal tibia. So in another word, in the upper extremity, you have more pro uh, growth from proximal and distal. In the uh, uh, lower extremity, you have much more growth around the knee, so in the middle more than the proximal and distal. So the middle of the uh, extremity, lower extremity, carries most of the growth, so around the knee carries most of the growth. So most of the growth of the extremity in general comes 65% will come around the knee, 15% from the proximal femur, and 20% from the distal tibia. So as a extremity, uh, um, as a, the lower extremity in general, most of the growth will happen around the knee, uh, you will have uh, 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 more growth in the distal tibia than in the proximal femur. So it's 65 around the knee, 20% uh, uh, um, uh, distal tibia, and 15% uh, proximal tibia.
if you see this here this is important as we're going to see later in the white mensley uh, way of detecting the growth so uh, uh, as we said here in in the percentage of the bone on the femur it's 70 percent distal femur 30 percent proximal and in the uh, tibia it's about 55 percent from the uh, proximal tibia and 45 percent from the distal tibia as a uh, extremity um, in general as we said uh, the 40 percent uh, 40 percent from the upper extremity comes from above in the humerus here and 40 percent from the around the wrist here and only 20 percent around the elbow as a general in the lower extremity we have 65 uh, percent around the knee 20% uh, uh, distal tibia and 15% the femur. Uh, this is very important. These numbers, we're going to talk to them again when we talk about the white mensley. Uh, but um, in general, remember 70% of the femur comes from the knee, 30% in the proximal femur. In the tibia, 55% of the uh, tibia comes from the uh, uh, proximal tibia and 45% comes from the distal tibia. So now let's talk about the uh, growth uh, phases. So there is two uh, very rapid growth phases, the fetal uh, growth and the early childhood. So for the fetal growth, that's a rapid growth for uh, the limbs will grow uh, uh, fast and then there will be the rotation. So the upper extremity will rotate externally and the thumb will be laterally. The lower extremity will rotate internally and the big toe will become median. So fetal growth, this is a very rapid growth phase um, uh, due during which the limb rotation will happen, the upper extremity rotate outside, the thumb will be lateral, the lower extremity rotate inward, and the big toe will be medial. For the early childhood, this is another rapid growth, and remember the child reaches the half of the adult height at the age of four years if he's male, and the age of three years if he's a girl. So girls at the age of three, they reach it half of their adult height, boys at the age of four reaches half of their adult. Uh, and uh, uh, the foot actually um, the growth um, uh, happens also quickly during the uh, early childhood and the age of two uh, the size of the uh, foot is basically half of the adult size so uh, the um, uh, early childhood rapid growth the um, uh, boy will reach his half of the adult height at the age of four girl will reach half of the adult at the age of three and for the foot uh, the, the foot reaches the uh, half of the adult size by the age of two. Uh, so uh, the foot, um, remember the foot, mat uh, foot bone maturation happens earlier than the other long uh, bone because it gives you a stable base during walking. So uh, the foot matures um, earlier, uh, it, it reaches a bigger size earlier, a uh, uh, relatively bigger size earlier because um, it gives you stable base during walking. So the third growth spurt is the adolescent growth spurt. So adolescent uh, growth spurt, we usually refer it as peak growth velocity. So it's a, 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 um, a phase of growth, um, rapid growth. Uh, that's why we call it the growth spurt. And most of the limb and spine deformities um, will accelerate during time. So this is uh, why the idiopathic scoliosis becomes obvious in, in that uh, time in the peak growth velocity. And also adolescent blonde will become more obvious. So adolescent growth is spurred. Uh, this is an early, uh, at a phase of a rapid growth. Um, we usually refer to it, to it as the peak gross velocity uh, because of that limb and spine deformities um, uh, are accelerated and becomes more obvious so you will be able to identify the idiopathic scoliosis and adolescent blonde. Um, uh, one important point you need to keep in mind is usually children continues to grow for about three years after their adolescent growth spurt or after their peak growth velocity as we're going to show in the next slide. So usually there is continued growth after that growth spurt. And also remember that the uh, adolescent growth spurt um, happen in the trunk length more than the lower limb length. Uh, so the uh, increase in the height in the adolescent growth spurt uh, comes mainly from the spine. Uh, so um, the, the, the increase in the height and the, the adolescent growth spurt is um, more derived from the trunk than the limbs. So remember the adolescent growth spurt um, happen more in the trunk than in the lower limb. So the, the vertebra, the, the pelvis, um, the, the, uh, the, the increase in the trunk length is more than the 
a limb uh, so most of the increase in the height will come from the trunk and there is some uh, gender differences in the adolescent growth spurt um, so in the female they have more growth of their uh, shoulders and their pelvis so adolescent growth spurt it's an area of peak growth velocity uh, children continues to grow three years after that um, uh, during that time uh, some deformities would become more obvious because of the growth like uh, bl adolescent blount and uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis uh, the growth spurt affect the trunk more than the lower extremity so you have more increase in the trunk than in the limbs um, and uh, there is uh, some gender differences so the peak growth velocity as you can see here is the time which you have the uh, highest growth uh, you can detect that with um, uh, height measurement every six months and there will be an area of peak growth that's the area that we call the peak growth velocity uh, and its indication of the adolescent growth spurt as we said usually there will be some growth mm, which is less but for about three years after the peak growth velocity uh, remember that peak growth velocity happens actually after the triradiate closure. Uh, so triradiate closure um, uh, uh, happens before peak growth velocity. So if you have a child and you get a pelvis x-ray and you see the triradiate, that means that this child most probably did not reach the peak growth velocity yet. And remember, is RISER 1 actually happened after the peak growth velocity. So um, once you start seeing a RISER 1 or RISER 2, that means that the maximum growth uh, velocity has already happened. So peak growth velocity, it can be uh, detected by serial measurement of height, and you will find that there is an area of an increase, keep growing of an increasing height. Um, uh, that maximum growth uh, velocity is the peak growth velocity. It happens after the triradiate closure. So triradiate closure happens before the uh, peak gross velocity. So if you get an X-ray, you see the triradiate that usually tells you that the uh, peak growth velocity did not happen yet. And then after that, uh, after the peak growth velocity, there is continued growth, but at a much slower rate for usually three years. Uh, and um, remember that RISER stage uh, usually, uh, research stage one, uh, two, three, four, all this happened after the peak growth velocity. So uh, when you start seeing uh, research stage two, three, that means that the child is already going uh, down in the rate of their growth. Um, and the, uh, the peak growth velocity, uh, as we said, it can be detected by, by serial uh, uh, heights and you see uh, the amount of increase. And when the amount of increase is the highest, that's the peak growth velocity. And this is indication for the adolescent growth spurt. So uh, we continue to talk about growth potential and um, indications for growth. Remember, this is a very important topic why we keep going through that because it helps you taking lots of decision in, uh, uh, in pediatric orthopedic, like when to stop uh, bracing, um, uh, when to proceed with uh, epiphysiodesis. All these is, uh, depend on growth. So um, we saw this picture uh, in the last slide. Um, this uh, picture here uh, coincides with this one. Remember, very important, peak growth velocity happens after the closure of the triradiate and before RISER-1. This is very important landmark here. Uh, usually, not always, but usually uh, the first menstrual period, the menarche in girls happen around the age of RISER-1. That's not, of course, in all cases, but usually it happens around that stage. Uh, so um, when you have a, a, a girl uh, in your scoliosis clinic and this girl had her first menstrual period, that means that she already passed her peak growth uh, velocity. As we said before, the growth in the sitting height is more than the lower limb height. Uh, uh, so um, the peak, uh, the adolescent growth spurt affect more the, uh, the trunk than the lower extremity. Uh, this is uh, uh, important. And as we said, three years after the peak growth, uh, you continue to grow. So growth happens three years after the peak growth in velocity. Uh, remember the elbow closure here um, uh, also happens with peak growth velocity. So closure of the triradiate happens before 
racer happen after elbow closure here as you can see in these pictures the elbow closure here of the olecranon usually coincide with the uh, with the peak growth velocity so if uh, uh, they ask you what is the most important landmark for uh, peak growth velocity it is not closure of the triradiate it's not racer one it's actually elbow closure here of the olecranon um, uh, recently, uh, the Sanders classification is coming more popular, so I want you to know the Sanders classification, or at least how it's based. It's based on the X-ray of the hand. It's um, uh, it is not uh, 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 it's not a skeletal age, um, but it is a, it's an indication for the growth uh, and the growth potential. So if the, we have the stage one. And it goes to stage eight. Stage eight meaning there is full uh, closure of uh, all uh, the physis, including the ulna and the uh, uh, radius. So this is stage eight. Stage seven, you still have ulna and radius, but all the hands uh, are closed. Um, uh, uh, stage uh, 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 six, um, uh, uh, you uh, basically uh, uh, have some of the metacarpal uh, heads here still. Uh, um, uh, seen um, stage uh, five uh, uh, through uh, four uh, you started to have a closure of the distal phalanx uh, stage uh, uh, three uh, we call it capping means that the epiphysis becomes uh, wider than the metaphysis uh, in stage uh, one it is smaller and in stage two it is equal uh, you don't have to remember all these details just remember it's an indication of the skeletal growth it is commonly used in scoliosis eight everything is closed seven everything except radius and ulna uh, is closed um, An important concept is the bone age so what is the bone age basically bone age is the average age at which uh, that bone reaches the specific maturation uh, so if i tell you that your uh, your bone age is 13 that means that the average 13 year old boy for example or girl has that picture of the bone if i tell you that your bone age is 15 for a girl that means that a 15 year old girl that's the average age or if i get 100 uh, a girl um, uh, uh, their, uh, and I get an x-ray of their left hand their average age will be 15 years so this is the bone age so the bone age is the average age at which uh, bone reaches a specific maturation in growth bone age is actually more important than chronological age why because kids can be um, uh, uh, going growing faster or slower than uh, uh, their uh, colleagues uh, or uh, similar uh, kids of the same age it can be up to two years so um, um, a boy can be 12 year old however his born age is 14 or born age is 10 so um, uh, that's why born age is more important than chronological age when you are considering uh, the maturation and uh, how do we detect the bone age? It's usually X-ray of the left hand or the elbow. Uh, the left hand, um, uh, classically, we use the uh, uh, atlas of Grolich and Pyle, uh, and you compare the left hand uh, with the uh, um, part of the book that uh, has the left hand of boys and or uh, the left hand uh, of girls depending on um, the gender of the uh, of the child that you're looking uh, and uh, remember some uh, kids with uh, short stature they may have just delayed bone age so uh, for example the 12 year old boy he may be uh, shorter than all his uh, classmates because he's still uh, uh, bone age wise he's 10 uh, but later on uh, when he catches up um, at the end, he may be longer than all his uh, classmates because uh, his final height was higher. So the bone age is more important than the chronological age. Bone age, again, is the average age at which bones reach specific maturation. Uh, kids can be two years um, uh, delayed or earlier than their bone age. Uh, and the bone age is usually from um, started by hand or left uh, or, uh, hand or elbow. We use uh, the atlas of Grolich and Pyle. Um, and remember, um, uh, kids with short stature that may be simply delayed bone age, meaning that they are um, lacking in their development. However, uh, the final uh, uh, height when they reach uh, their full maturation uh, may be normal or even uh, higher.
So now let's discuss how to predict the final limb, the final limb length discrepancy at maturity. So you have a child with difference between right and left side, and you want to know at the end of the maturity, skeletal maturity, what will be the difference. So there is dif uh, different methods for that. Um, uh, there is the Paley multiplication method, in which um, we basically use the current difference. So the difference, for example, now is two centimeter, and then we use age specific and gender specific multiplier. So for example, this patient is a boy at the age of two. 12, there will be a certain number, so you will multiply that uh, uh, that number with the current difference that will give you the the uh, the, uh, the difference between the limb both sides at the end at the end of the um, uh, the growth or at the age of the skeletal maturity. Uh, another uh, method is the Mosley graph method. This method requires two measurements, so it, uh, you have to have two me uh, measurements. So um, one measurement in a visit, and then later on, six months or one year, you repeat, and you put um, in that graph the the length of the longer side and the length of the shorter side, and using this graph, you can detect the the final limb length discrepancy. Uh, a third method is called white minimalist method, or sometimes they call the arithmetic method, and it depends on these numbers that uh, proximal tibia is uh, proximal femur is three millimeter, distal femur is nine, proximal uh, uh, proximal femur is three, distal femur is nine, proximal tibia is six, and distal tibia is four, and then it uses the age of 14 as the end of the growth of the girls and 16 as the end of the growth of the boy. Uh, we know that um, uh, the growth, uh, uh, the final growth is at 16 in girls and 18 in boys roughly. However, uh, this method uses these years because after that the growth in the extremity in the limbs uh, are minimal. So um, uh, the, uh, the ages that they use for the growth is 14 for girls and 16 for boy. Again, uh, the two most important number is 9 in the distal femur, 6 in the proximal tibia. So we're still discussing the topic of the final limb length discrepancy at the age of the skeletal maturity and the time of epiphysiodesis. So uh, again, the white minulose formula have mm, assumptions. The assumption is 0.9 centimeter from the distal femur, 0.6 centimeter from the proximal tibia. If you combine both together, it becomes 1.5 centimeter if you do um, epiphysiodesis of both distal femur and proximal tibia. And it has the assumption of end of growth at 14 for female and 16 for boys. Um, we discussed that uh, the growth is usually 16 in girls and 18 in boys, but the uh, growth that happens in the last two, uh, two years in the extremity is not as much. So the assumption of this formula, the white minerals formula, is 0.9 centimeter from the distal femur, 0.6 centimeter from the proximal tibia. And uh, if you combine, it's 1.5 centimeter uh, from both, and it's 14 year end of growth of girl and 16 year end of growth of boy. So let's say that you want to, um, to gain 1.5 centimeter uh, 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 of length um, uh, correction. So in this case, um, and you have only one year, you can do uh, both. You can do the 0.9 and the 0.6. So you can do a physiodesis of the proximal uh, femur and distal tibia. And that will give you in one year uh, the correction amount. Uh, this uh, the white minulus area is a rough calculation. It is uh, it is the commonest one that will come in the exam, and actually uh, there was a recent study that showed that it's the most accurate mo method to take the growth remaining. We used to say that it's not as good, but with the recent studies, they all confirm it that the white minulus method is actually more accurate than other methods for detection of the growth remaining. So quickly, the assumption is 0.6 centimeter per year from the distal um, proximal tibia, 0.9 from the distal femur, and the growth end at 14 for girls and 16 for boy. Other method, um, we talked about the Mosley graph, um, which um, this is the Mosley graph. As I mentioned in the previous slide, you have to get at least two uh, uh, measurements. So here, this patient got, for example, three measurements in three different visits. And then you draw the uh, uh, short side and the long side. And then uh, there, there is three lines here of, for the time of the epiphysiotesis. 
uh, this inclination if you decided to do proximal tibia and distal femur, uh, one if you do the distal femur and one if you do the proximal tibia. And then from the age of maturity, you draw a line uh, uh, if, if from the uh, short side and that should uh, get you to uh, roughly where you, you should do the epiphysiodesis uh, in the long side. Um, uh, the mostly method does not come in the exam as it used to be before. Um, and it's not as commonly used as it was before. Uh, but uh, roughly, this is how it goes. You need more than one visit. You draw a line for even for the long side and the short side, and then you go from the uh, age of maturity uh, with a line that has the inclination depending on which side, which um, correction are you planning for, distal femur, proximal tibia, or both. And of course, there is also the Paley method, as we discussed, depends on the multiplier. Uh, and there, there is something called Anderson and Green. Remember that um, the Mosley and Paley are actually derived from the Anderson and Green charts. Uh, so um, uh, all this is to get you to the final limb length discrepancy and the age of physiodesis. Uh, the one that usually comes in the exam is the white menelos. And actually, uh, recent studies showed it's more accurate than the others. 0.9 from the femur, 0.6 from the tibia. If you combine both, it's 1.5, 14 years, end of growth in girls, 16, end of growth uh, of boys. So this is an example of a physiodesis I did for one of my patients. Patient has arteriovenous malformation. Usually patients with arteriovenous malformation will get more blood supply to the affected side, so the side will be longer than the other side. So you can see here, um, this side is longer than this side. Patient standing on a five centimeter um, wedge here and the pelvis is level. So the difference is five centimeter. We got the skeletal age. We did um, uh, uh, physiodesis of the proximal tibia and distal femur. And at the age of the growth, both sides were the same um, uh, height. So this is a, an example of a physiodesis. Um, I'd like to go through one of the scenarios. For example, if they give you a patient um, had a, a distal femur fracture uh, and now it's like 18 months and there is um, complete closure. So that means that there is no growth um, remaining or not growth expected from that side. Uh, they give you, for example, the difference is 1.5 centimeter now. So what to do uh, next? Uh, and when. So in this case, you have to do um, a, a contralateral physiodesis of actually both proximal femur and distal tibia. Why the distal femur? Because you don't want the, um, the difference to increase. So if we know that the side, the affected side is not growing anymore because they say complete closure. So you have to do the femur on the other side. So you avoid uh, the, uh, 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 avoid having any more difference. And then in order to correct the difference, you have to do a physiodesis of the tibia. Uh, we know that she's 12, so she has two more years gross. And it's, um, uh, we said it's uh, uh, six millimeters. So six millimeter by two is 1.2. Uh, so basically, that will get you very close to the difference. So, uh, for example, this is a, this is a, a scenario that you can get in the exam. Uh, when will be the physiodesis? It will be now because you have only two years remaining. So you want to, to make use of these two years. 0 0.6 by 2 will get you 1.2, which is closer to 1.5. And you have to do the other femur. Why? Because the, this, the affected femur is not growing. So you want to do the other femur so the difference does not increase. I hope now you understand the topic of growth uh, in children uh, and um, how to use that um, in decision making and thank you for listening to the lecture.